Welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, where our job is to help you build visibility, professional credibility, and connection with your ideal client by putting the human at the center of innovative marketing so you can build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship with your ideal clients. I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm honored that you're here with me. If you haven't joined our wonderful marketing transformation community yet, go to innovabiz.co and collect your free gift as well. Do subscribe to the show and also leave a review because it helps others find us. Let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. The important inflection points in your business don't kind of announce themselves and and introduce themselves at the table in headquarters. You know, they they start they, the the early warnings are to be found where you know some a customer says something weird or. A salesperson goes, well, that never happened before. Or, you know, there's some shift in the environment that's still early, right? Still early stage, but that presages what could be the unfolding of of a, a subsequent inflection point. Welcome back. I hope you've had an awesome week so far. If you haven't yet listened to my recent conversations with Rebecca Arbona of Brandtrue and with buyer's agent Kitty Parker, then check them out after you've listened to today's conversation, of course. I'm really excited to have on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest today, Rita McGrath. She's a best-selling author, a sought-after speaker, and a long-time professor at Columbia Business School. She's widely recognized as a premier expert on leading innovation and growth during times of uncertainty. Rita has achieved the number one achievement award for strategy from the prestigious Thinkers 50 and has been consistently named as one of the world's top 10 management thinkers. As a consultant to CEOs, her work has had lasting impact on the strategy and growth programs of Fortune 500 companies all around the world. Rita is the author of the best-selling books, The End of Competitive Advantage and Seeing Around Corners, How to Spot Inflection Points in Business Before They Happen, as well as three other books. In our discussion today, Rita talked to me about how to use indicators to see around corners. And we talked about lagging versus current versus leading indicators. We talked about the disruption happening right now and how we can create our desired future. And Rita explained that snow melts at the edges and what we can learn from that. Without further ado, then let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Rita McGrath. Hi, I'm your host, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm really excited to welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast today from New York in the USA, Rita McGrath, who's a best-selling author, a sought-after speaker, and a long-time professor at Columbia Business School. She's widely recognized as a premier expert on leading innovation and growth, particularly during times of uncertainty. Welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast, Rita. It's a real privilege to have you as my guest. Oh, it's a pleasure to be with you virtually. Now, Alex Osterwalder, who was our guest on episode 293 of the Innova Buzz podcast, suggested that we have a conversation with you. So big shout out to Alex. Great. Rita, your latest book is called Seeing Around Corners, which is a fascinating title. Um, How to Spot Inflection Points in Business Before They Happen. So I'm really keen to dig into that some more today, particularly in our current environment of COVID um, that has totally disrupted a lot of business models. But I've lived through a couple of uh, serious business model disruptions. My first job was in the photographic industry in the days when film was just about to die. So that was certainly a big inflection point. Um, But before we start talking about all things business growth and inflection points, seeing around corners, how did you get into the field of innovation and strategy? Um, Well, a little bit by accident and a little bit by passion. (laughs) 
So um, my my house when I was growing up was uh, my my parents were both PhD scientists, and they they always really enjoyed talking about business, you know, and why people in organizations made the decisions that they did and so forth. So I guess growing up, it just seemed it was something I didn't think was weird to be interested in. Let's put it that way. Hmm. <laughs> and then um, my original ambition when I graduated from university was to get into the world of politics and policy. And so I got a master's in public administration from Columbia and from our School of International and Public Affairs. And then um, after some years in government, kind of hit a plateau and realized that I really needed to change things. And at that time, business schools were really exploding. It was a, a you know very high demand market. And obviously, if you had a PhD, that gave you a bit of an itch. So, <laughs> so I got into Wharton, which was doable for our family. And I started working with the Entrepreneurship Center there. So the gentleman who was running it at the time was a guy named Ian McMillan, a very well-known scholar in entrepreneurship circles. And coincidentally, we had a grant from Citigroup to study um, 20, well, to study 35 of their corporate ventures spanning back about 15 years. And what was unusual about that grant was they wanted us to study both the successes and the failures. So I was put in charge of that project. And that was really where I just thought, wow, this is just so interesting. Because if you think about it, corporate ventures have, you know, every ingredient of a fascinating sort of Docu series. I mean, they've got yeah, highs yeah. and lows and pathos, and you've got you know villains and heroes and <laughs> people jousting against the odds. And it, it was, it's absolutely fascinating. <laughs> hmm. Yes, I like to think of the whole thing as a hero's journey, and you can apply the hero's journey from Joseph Campbell into business. Absolutely. Hmm. Okay, now um, tell us a little bit about inflection points. Then, what what? Do you mean by inflection points? I mean, I think I have an understanding, but I'd like to hear your explanation. Sure. So I define a strategic inflection point as some shift, typically in the external environment, that causes a 10x change in something about your business. So, you know, you were just talking about the film a while ago. Well, if you think about what digital did to film, it was, mm. you know, 10x cheaper, 10x faster, not as good in the beginning, you know, in terms of quality, yeah. but but the fact that it was so much cheaper and so much faster meant that there were early applications you could use it for. And what that inflection point does is it changes the recipe for success that, that you've got. And, you know, so any business, and, and I'll stick with film if you like, um, it grows up at a moment in time when certain things are possible and certain things aren't. And what an inflection point does is it changes those calculations. It changes what can be done. So if I take YouTube, just as an example, you know, if I'd said to you when YouTube was first commercialized, oh my God, you know, this is a thing that's going to completely change the nature of advertising. And it's going to upend the business models of major movie studios. And it's going to, you know, allow people to make a full-time living from doing funny stuff in their garages. You would have looked at me and said, YouTube, are you kidding? You know, the cat video mm. people. <laughs> <laughs> And and so we don't really realize the potential of inflection points when they first emerge. And I think that's really where the opportunities lie in many cases, because um, they take a long time before they actually show up and re represent a threat to our business. I mean, even if you take digital in film, um, I mean, the first digital camera was invented by Kodak in the 70s. Yeah. And it wasn't really until a decade or so later that you started to see consumer facing digital cameras mm. at all and and they weren't very good i mean the pictures were terrible mm. um by, by yeah. modern standards so so you know i think i think it just it, the opportunity is if it does take a long time and you're paying attention you can get ahead of them mm. well i mean having lived through that film thing and having having been on a task force with ACFA to actually investigate the first consumer digital camera that sony brought out which was really the the tipping point i guess mm -hmm. um I can really relate to particularly what you've just said, but the whole story of the seeing around the corner. I mean, for me there, we were at the corner and mm -hmm. so we could see what was mm -hmm. coming, but, and yet a lot of, um, a lot of people in the established or in the leadership of ACFA in particular, and I'm sure the same was happening at other companies said, well, the quality is pretty awful at the moment compared to film. So we'll just continue making better film. So how do you how do you 
get to a point, maybe even before before that particular event of saying, well, you know, let's think about this longer term. This is not going away. Right. This is possibly going to be developed, and with with current the current rate of technological development, it could actually happen real quick if we're not careful. Mm -hmm. So I think the thing you need to be thinking about in with respect to that is what's the data that you're using to make um, decisions? And I always put data into three categories. So you've got lagging indicators, which are great information, but it's you can't change it, right? So yesterday's profits, great information, you can't change them. It's already happened. Then you've got current indicators, which are kind of telling you where you are right now. So things like your net promoter score, uh, your employee engagement scores, those kinds of things. They, they tell you where you are, sort of like the speedometer in your car. Mm. And the hardest information to get of all are the leading indicators. And the leading indicators, interestingly, um, by definition, you know, reasonable people can disagree because it hasn't happened yet. You can develop very politicized interpretations of what those futures can be. And one of the other things about leading indicators is I see this a lot. People confuse predictions with preferences. And so, you know, I know what a future I'd prefer is, but that doesn't mean that's actually what I think is going to happen <laughs> if I really mm. step back and take an unvarnished view of it. And I've been very intrigued at this pandemic to have so many of these pundits and prognosticators um, get up and talk about, oh, this pandemic, you know, yeah, it's awful right now, but it's going to be great. We're going to have gender and racial parity. We're going to see income inequality disappear. We're going to have a revolution in healthcare. I mean, and you listen to them and you're thinking, hang on, <laughs> this is a global pandemic, an economic crisis, a social justice crisis, and underneath all of that is a long-burning environmental crisis. I, 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 I think it would be great if all that you were predicting came true, but I, that, that doesn't look like, <laughs> mm. I think that's a little rose-colored glasses, don't you think? And, uh, you know, and I'm not saying you have to be all doom and gloom. I just think it's really important not to let, well, to try to, as much as you can, uh, fight against your own biases when, when you're thinking about what the future could hold. Hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I have to laugh um, when you said about the pandemic, because the other thing that that all these armchair experts saying, here's how you best deal with this pandemic right now, and here's how you keep your business um, going, ticking over, and here's what to do to take advantage of it and whatnot. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. The only thing that is really comparable to this pandemic was the Spanish flu back in 1918, and I, I'm surprised there's so many people around that still remember it so well that they they can share the experience with us today. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there's, you know, it's interesting when you think about the great sweep of human history is, you know, the last few generations have been remarkably fortunate in that we have not had to take into account hmm. you know, global pandemics. I mean, we've had fantastic drugs and the antibiotic revolution and um, so I think one of the things that people haven't given enough credence to is flare-ups of communicable diseases have been a plague throughout humanity, <laughs> and we're really mm. lucky to have avoided that for a long time. Yeah. Well, I mean, there were voices that warned, I mean, I think um, Bill Gates, there's a famous uh, TED talk he did where he, it's, I think it's about three or four years old, He's where he... We actually talked about the risk of a global pandemic. And if yeah. you look at that talk, I mean, hindsight's a wonderful thing, but he did give that talk in 2015. You look at that talk and there's a, so much that parallels what's actually happening now in, oh, yeah. in COVID. So, you know, he, he, he was there looking around the corner, if you like. Well, I think what's even more interesting is that people took him seriously. And in the U.S., we developed an entire pandemic infrastructure that was ready to be rolled into hospitals. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration uh, was on the brink of issuing rules that would have put provisions in place for hospitals to be pandemic prepared. And it was disbanded. It was actually happening. And it was actually disbanded just a mm. couple of short years before this all started. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, that's that's in some ways parallel to my ACFA experience there where people kind of had signs in place and decided, no, it wasn't really that serious. Well, you know, it's always 
and this is again the thing about leading indicators um it's always difficult to make a sacrifice in the present for something that's of uncertain benefit in the future. And, you know, even today, there are people running around saying, oh, all that money we spent on Y2K compliance, that was a waste of time because nothing happened. Mm. And I have a friend who works in public health, and she said, you know, the, the wretched thing about my job, even though it's got a lot of rewarding aspects, but if I do my job right, everybody says, you were panicking for nothing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, because the bad thing doesn't happen. That's and right. how do you measure oh. the impact mm. of a bad thing that doesn't happen? So, we are constantly replaying the last disaster when we when we think about the next one. Hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting one. It's, uh, I've had interesting discussions about the Y2K and I, I said, well, you know, I went through a lot of stuff there with the Y2K and compliance and there was an enormous amount of resources put into that all across the globe and, you know, it impacted all of us in business. If we hadn't have done what we did then, who knows what would have happened? Exactly. <laughs> hmm. Oh, exactly. Well, and I think I think you know it, what was interesting then was that the predictions were both vivid and specific. So you know, airplanes are going to drop out of the sky, and nuclear plants are going to become unstable. Mm. And you know, people were spilling out all these scenarios about what would happen, basically, to a globe of confused computers. Um, and, uh, um, and I think one of the most interesting things about that is is because it was so scary, people actually took action. Mm. Well, coming back to the indicators, I mean, I was looking at uh, your table in the book about lagging current and leading indicators, and, you know, you give the examples of customer churn, employee turnover, revenue from new products as lagging indicators, and then you talk about customer satisfaction, employee engagement, and customer usage as current indicators, and I kind of, at that point, I thought, well, you know, the lagging indicators are numerical we've got measures you know there's clear there's no debate over that you know customer churn how many customers are leaving um, that's a number and you can measure that and so on and then customer satisfaction well yeah you can get some measures of that if you do surveys if you talk to customers but there's an element of interpretation that's brought in there and as you said with the leading indicators then it becomes uh, interpretation, assumptions, um, biases, you know, what you think, what the signs are pointing to might happen versus what you would like to happen mm -hmm. um, and different interpretations of what people think might happen. So how do you deal with all that? Because, you know, flagging indicators are so easy because most of them are numerical and it's just numbers and you can say, well, here's what the numbers mean. That's That's where the interpretation comes in. But with the leading indicators in particular, there's so much interpretation. Well, there is. And I think one of the problems that we as human beings have in looking at leading indicators is, firstly, we don't spend enough time to really sense make around them. Secondly, because reasonable people can disagree, reasonable people do. <laughs> so what ends up happening is, you know, you get these warring factions. Are, and this is something I find hilarious in business, which is you will see two perfectly competent people arguing with each other about who's right, about something that neither of them have any data about whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just bizarre. Um, so so I think a couple of things that, that make it more real to people. Um, firstly, if you can wrap the leading indicators in a really compelling story, um, and there's a couple of different techniques for doing that, but if you can make it feel like, yes, this is a newspaper ripped, you know, this is a headline ripped from tomorrow's newspaper, or this is, you know, something that really, really could happen. And if it did, you know, it would be pretty bad and, and so forth. And so I think Part of what leaders need to do if they want to bring the message of these leading indicators home is they need to both create, craft a story. I think it also helps to have some kind of time frame. Um, you know, like like we don't think this is going to happen for X months, but we think any time after Y months, it could. And these are the things we're going to be paying attention to. So, you know, making it real for people is is pretty crucial. Now, once you've decided what you're going to do about an inflection point, that's when you really need everybody on board and, you know, end a discussion. This is what, the direction we're going. <laughs> now we have to move. And what you saw in, I'll go back to film, um, what you saw in the case of Fujifilm was they got it. I mean, they got the mm -hmm. idea of digital. They really understood that this was going to be a brand new kind of business. 
And instead of asking the question, how do we save film, which is what most of the camera, you know, most of the film companies mm. did, they said, where else might our capabilities be useful? And I, I was on stage actually with um, a gentleman named Mr. Yazoo, who was one of their senior people at the time. And uh, he actually showed a fascinating slide, which showed um, a microscopic il illustration of a piece of color film. And I didn't know this, but apparently color film has just all these different microscopic layers to create oh, yeah, yeah. color yeah. effect. And I didn't know that. But then he Very showed- Very complex uh, systems. <laughs> yeah. But then he showed on the next slide, he showed a microscopically thin sliced piece of human liver. And it was almost the identical image. And he said, what we realized was that we had capabilities, not based on film, but capabilities based on imaging and based on, you know, a refraction of, of fields and being able to interpret what images look like. In other words, we had capabilities that could be relevant to a whole bunch of other markets. And um, they went after those markets. They didn't they didn't just sit on film. They said, you know, we had there are other things we know how to do that come from film, but that are not film <laughs> and that we can use elsewhere. So they got into cosmetics. They got into medical imaging. They got into all kinds of new markets um, because they had this fervent belief that this inflection point was coming through and they needed to, you know, quick, quickly reconfigure their business. Hmm. Well, the other thing that Fuji also did, uh, and I think this took a little while from what I could tell from the outside, um, but I was interested in this because it was similar to ACFA where I was working in that they also had a camera manufacturing mm -hmm. um, arm, as did ACFA. Mm -hmm. And so they said, well, what can we do with our cameras if this digital thing takes off? Um, how can we be ready with our cameras? And, and now Fuji make you know uh, not the top line not the the um, premium quality cameras i mean the nikons and the canons but the kind of next level fuji is is really big in that level and are really well respected and so that you know they made the transition in in a different business whereas the aqua camera division just disappeared <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, I like the metaphor you talk about in the book, snow melting from the edges. So talk to us a little bit about that and how does that relate to, you know, recognizing some of the early warnings in, in one of these inflection points that might impact your industry? Sure. So the phrase really comes from an inspiration that Andy Grove mentioned. He said, you know, if, if you wish to know where spring is making itself felt, you must travel to the periphery because that's where the snow is most exposed. And the way I phrase it is snow melts from the edges. And hmm. it's a reminder to executives that the, the important inflection points in your business don't kind of announce themselves and, and introduce themselves at the table in headquarters. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they start, they, the, the early warnings are to be found where, you know, some, a customer says something weird or, a salesperson goes, well, that never happened before. Or, you know, there's some shift in the environment that's still early, right? Still early stage, mm. but that presages what could be the unfolding of, of a, a subsequent inflection point. And so in the book, I talk about eight different ta techniques, eight different practices that you can use to get out to the edges where these changes are happening as an executive. And they're not hard and they're not expensive, but a lot mm. of times we don't do them, you know, so for example, one of the practices is, um, you know, go and experience yourself where some of these changes might be, you know, get out of the building, as Steve Blank likes to say. <laughs> um, and I think one of the problems, and there's a, an absolutely fascinating book out just, just now, just recently, about what happened at GE, and I think it's called Lights Out. Yeah, it's, it's called Lights Out, the, mm -hmm. you know, like the tragedy of GE or something. Um, but one of the things that intrigued me about the book was they did a meticulous description of the chairman's sort of entourage and, and you know, what would be done to basically make sure that every single want of his could be attended to at any given point in time. And so things like making sure his favorite brand of soda was available and was cold and, it, it, you know, and oh, and the, the meeting rooms, because he apparently his very warm body temperature the meeting rooms all had to be chilled to like 65 degrees and so the entire rest of GE's top management is sitting there in parkas you know um <laughs> and 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 but I think it's just illustrative of this dilemma that the more senior you get and I don't think that anybody means badly by this hmm. but the more senior you get the harder it is to get unfiltered information to get really clear on what's going on with customers and what's going on sort of at other parts of your organization 
And so what I think the better leaders are doing is, first of all, they create a climate in which people feel they can be presented with uncomfortable news, you know, bad news, news that isn't sort of all puppies and roses. Secondly, they have mechanisms for really getting out to the edges. Um, so a couple of examples, I have uh, one acquaintance who's a CEO who uh, has a computer program. And what the computer program does is every month it randomly picks 20 employees anywhere in the global empire. Um, and they all come together. Well, before pre pre COVID, they all came together and he would have a big breakfast, like a two hour breakfast. And he would just have them all at a big kind of round table. And he would just go, go around the table and say, so what's, what's going on in your part of the world? What's going on where you are? So no handlers, no prepackaged stuff, no PowerPoints, just conversation. Hmm. And he said, you know, some months there's nothing new and some months I'm like, oh my God, I had no idea. But also, you know, the word gets around the company, right? And so if you get anointed as one of these people who's going to go and talk to the big boss, uh, people will come and tell you stuff, you know, and then you have, you know, here's what, what we want. Now, of course, you have to be careful about it getting gamed and people's motivations. But I thought that was just a really interesting and very visible, very symbolically resonant um, element of his saying, I, I'm here to listen. I want to learn. Hmm. Yeah. Well, it's, it sort of comes back to the culture of the business as well, doesn't it? Um, but having those meaningful conversations can be really important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was reminded of, I don't know what this show is called and whether you have it in the US. I imagine it probably, the idea probably came from the US, but where the, the boss of the business goes incognito into, like, for example, he might go into a storefront if it's a, if it's a bricks and mortar store and, um, be like uh, the new the new employee and be mentored by somebody and and then he goes through all the things and and quite often they come out of that and they say you know we never realized that these things go on or that customers have these concerns and so there's so many learnings by doing something like that I mean that's yeah. a bit extreme but it's... no I think it's a great I mean you know orchestrating something like that even if it's not on television, um, can can do. It's called Undercover Boss. Here is is the name. Okay, of the yeah, yeah, that program. makes sense. Yeah. yeah, I'm reminded. Um, our son, he can't have been more than 16, but he went to work at um, um, one of those game exchange stores here in the U.S. So at the time, you would have video games on compact discs, and um, when people used the game, they could bring it back and then exchange it for another game. It was called GameStop. And um, so this kid comes home, 16 years old, right? And he's in a grumpy mood. Now, you know, 16-year-old boys tend to be in grumpy yeah. moods anyway. But but he was particularly grumpy that particular evening. And we were, we're, we're all a little concerned. We're like, what, what's, what happened? And he sighs deeply. And he says, corporate. <laughs> <laughs> and it turns out some efficiency expert at corporate had issued this edict about how the store shelves were to be labeled or something. And my son is like, well, what he doesn't realize is our having to do that means we've now got to go through four steps, right, to get the things to where they need. I wasn't sure what the details were, but but he had customers waiting and he had people who were being unhappy and everybody was crabby in the store. And it's just, to me, it was a perfect example of this exact phenomenon, which is you make these decisions mm -hmm. sort of on Mount Olympus and have absolutely no relationship with what is going on on the shop floor. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've had a couple of customer experiences recently where I... I came to the conclusion after you know a very short time of being totally frustrated and annoyed I thought nobody in their right mind would be consciously annoying and you know ticking customers off to that extent I mean it was almost as if it was a process specifically designed to do that and I thought I wonder if you know their own senior management have ever gone through their own processes well that happened to me with Nokia years ago um and I asked the question because because one of my hobbies, they were a big client of mine for many years. And one of my sort of hobbies as I would travel around the world again, pre-COVID, um, was I would go into phone stores and just look at what was going on because it's very interesting. You know, you can kind of see right in front of you the market share. You can see what the sales guys are recommending. You can see what they're not recommending. And, da, da, da. and so I was teaching a class full of Nokia people. And I said, so how, you know, how do you find the experience in a phone store? And they all looked at me with blank faces and I said, <laughs> what's that? Yeah. What you do say more, you know? And they said, well, we don't get our phones from phone stores. We get our phone, uh, you know, R and D sends them to us and we test them out and they, and they have no idea. And these are the mm. people designing the next generation phone. <laughs> mm. Yeah. I used to work in the uh, uh, supplying raw materials to decorative paint manufacturers and, um, 
we used to go into the stores, into the paint stores and talk to the um, salespeople there, talk to the contractors that would come in to buy and find out. And, and our clients our, would always get upset with us. What are you doing meddling in the end user market? We say, well, actually, we're not meddling in it. We're trying to understand what's going on at, at that end of the market to see, you know, to recognize trends, to see what people are actually wanting, what problems they have, things that we could do to make our or learn things that we can do to make our products better so I always found that a bit humorous as well yeah yeah it is it's weird it's weird Mm -hmm. so when when we recognize some early signs of an inflection point let's say and and we talked about you know different potential futures and the disagreements that might come about there but how can we how can we kind of be proactive rather than reactive and and aim to create a future that we might desire rather than say, well, this might happen or this might happen depending on the assumptions that we call right, Mm -hmm. if you like. Mm -hmm. How can we say, well, okay, let's engineer as much as we can control so that this desired future actually is more likely? Right. So a couple of of, um, practices that are associated with being able to do this. And the first one is sort of an Uber practice, and it really has to do with managing your resource allocation across portfolios of activities. And so some of the things you're working on are today's reality, right? Some of them are, you know, the next generation of tomorrow's reality. And then some of them are really much more exploratory options for the future. And if you think about how you can cast an innovation path Um, What you're really trying to do is go from these options that are, by definition, they're small investments you're making that buy you the right, but not the opportunity, but sorry, that buy you the opportunity, but not the commitment to make a future commitment. And so those are the things that give you that window on the future because you're participating in them. So you're, you're talking to, you know, the entrepreneurs, you're exploring what's coming out of the research labs, you're you know, listening to what the the young people who are going to be the employees of the future, what's on their minds. You know, that's that's sort of your options is where you're getting the ideas. Um, and then to decide what to do, I think what you really need is, again, back to this rich picture of, you know, given what I see and what I know and, and the basic assumptions about the world, um, we're going to go try and create um, a future that's more attractive to us. So, You know, a canonical example of this would be Adobe. And as you recall, Adobe, in its its initial heyday, uh, they made very expensive shrink-wrapped software that they sold Mm. to, you know, graphics people and designers and so forth. And and a couple of things happened to Adobe. In 2008, their business took a hit because the business model was, I sell shrink-wrapped software, you buy it, you own it. Two years later, I have new and improved shrink-wrapped software and you buy that. And so it's like almost like a Microsoft Intel upgrade cycle kind of thing. Well, what happened in 2008 was customers all over the world kind of said, you know, you know, we're good. <laughs> we're good. Whatever new and improved thing you've got, we've got better <laughs> uses for our cash right now. So um, we'll just ha- we'll just hang out for another year. So that was the first big shock for the system. But what started to happen back then was you started to see the emergence of cloud computing as we know it now. And so the shrink wrap stuff had a business model variability, but then they became aware, you know, if this cloud stuff actually becomes cheap enough and good enough and broadband is fast enough, there's going to be some disruptive competitor who's going to come into our markets and go, ha, you know, I could just distribute this stuff in the cloud. I don't have to, I don't have to use retail outlets. I don't have to have boxes. I don't have to ship CDs around. I could just go direct to consumer. And they, and that became a sufficiently compelling idea that they actually shifted their entire business model uh, to that model. Now, couple of interesting dynamics about that. The first was that Adobe used to be a premium product. Like to be an Adobe customer, you had to have above a certain threshold of spend. So it had to be really, really important to you. Once you've got it as a software, as a subscription model on the cloud, you can now be an Adobe customer for $7.99 a month, all the way up to, you know, I don't know, twenty. Mm-hmm. $30,000 a month. Um, so they really broadened their reach in terms of what customers they could get. But the second thing that they did was, and that this I thought was very courageous on the part of their CEO. He said, you know, what we're selling has to be better. There's something about moving this 
set of capabilities to the web that has to be better than you could get if it was on a shrink wrapped box. And this is where things like um, secure DocuSigning comes in or you know, very uh, well orchestrated collaboration environments, right? So you could now have distributed minds working on these creative projects when before each instance of the software was just in its own little silo. So I think, I mean, that, that's a classic example because it was a very successful transition into let's forge um, a, a new kind of future for ourselves. Yeah, yeah. And of course, they've also got a lot of data about what their customers are using because Adobe's got um, a huge suite of software. And I know because I'm an Adobe customer with my photography. So they know which software I'm using. And so every now and then I'll get an advertisement saying, you know, you might be interested in this. So they're not promoting um, the PDF. I'm not sure what it's called, the PDF software or or the InDesign software or the others that they have, which are for designers. They're promoting things that are related to photography, which so they've got that information about me. They know that's my interest. So I'm more likely to be interested in that than if they just sent me all these random advertisement for other yeah. software. Yep, absolutely. Hmm. All right. So, um, and I read a, I think I, it was a blog post or maybe in your newsletter recently, an example about Buffer. So tell us about that one, oh, Buffer and Buffer. The Smoke Test, because I think that kind of highlights a similar point. Yeah. So it's a great story. So um, let me preface this by saying one of the things that has been really depressing in the last you know, five-ish years, is this flood of crazy money going into um, entrepreneurship businesses, but going on to, into venture capital-backed entrepreneurial businesses. We work would be sort of the poster child for why this is so nuts. Um, and these are businesses that skipped a crucial step in Entrepreneurship 101, in my opinion. So, you know, Entrepreneurship 101 says find a product, you know, find have an idea, find product market fit, go to market the idea, scale your business. And what a lot of these companies did was they went right from have an idea to scale your business, <laughs> you know? So if I were to take WeWork or Uber, I mean, they're basically subsidizing both sides of the customer equation on the premise that somehow we're going to have network effects and um, we'll be able to build a defensible business. And I objected to that, like, from the time this started to be a thing. Now, frustratingly, it's lasted a lot longer than I thought it could. So what I love about Buffer is it's much closer to what I would preach in Entrepreneurship 101. So uh, Joel Gassion was a web designer based in the UK and um, had he was kind of a failed entrepreneur. He was sort of getting by on his web designs, but not a really sort of satisfying life. But what he was trying to do to promote his web business was he was trying to use social media and he was just kind of a one person shop. And at the time, social media tools were not very, they're still not very sophisticated. So hmm. if you wanted to sort of, space your tweets out during the day, let's say, um, there was no easy way to do that. So you'd have to sort of schedule them. And what he was frustrated by was, you know, web design work is very concentrated, deep work, you know, breaking off every 20 minutes to go tweet something is not a useful mm. way of structuring your day. And he started to wonder if anybody else had this problem, right? So he decided being a web designer to, to test it. He did what he called a smoke test. And um, the, he, he created two web pages. So the first web page said, um, want to tweet, um, want to control your tweeting or something, tweet more consistently with, consistently with Buffer, click here to find out more. You click through and it would take you to a second page. It said, oh, you caught us before we were ready. Give us your email address to be kept informed of our progress. So what he's got now is he's starting to build a base of potentially interested stakeholders. So they could be customers, they could just be curious people. Um, so then he wanted to get some information about pricing. What would people pay for this? You know, um, before I give up my day job, I better be assured somebody's mm -hmm. going to actually shell out some money for this thing. So he created a third web page, which went in between the two. So the first page was the same. So tweet more consistently with, with Buffer. Then you go to the second page and it's got, here's our plans, right? So here's what you get for the free plan. Here's what you get for the enterprise plan. Here's what you get for the you know team plan. Um, click on the one that you want most, and then they would land on the third page. Now he's got some information about, you know, does this idea have enough equity? Is the pain point big enough that somebody would pay to um, to get it um, addressed? And um, he got enough information that he and a co-founder sort of hacked together the initial versions of Buffer. They kept it very tight 
you know, it was just for Twitter in the early stages. It was just this very simple service. Um, but eventually what they were able to do was start to scale it. Um, they've been in business now, I want to say eight years, 10 years. They've got millions of clients all over the world. Um, but they started off with this, you know, really simple prototype of what the pain point could be. And not, not, you know, I think what a lot of not very successful entrepreneurs do is they, they throw everything in the kitchen sink into their initial idea, right? Hmm. Uh, because they're afraid that they'll never get a chance at another one, right? So they make the original thing just so complex that yeah. nobody can understand what it does. <laughs> right? hmm. And so I think Buffer is a nice story of, of how you um, don't have that happen. Yeah, and and they're very successful. I mean, I'm a client of Buffer today, and and use it for a whole lot of things that they do beyond just um, scheduling your tweets. Oh yeah, well they've mm. of course developed far mm. far along now. And of course, you know that development is funded once they get some customers for the early prototype. Then they generate revenue, which they can invest back to add more features to the product. And also, you know, by taking the approach they did, I'm guessing that they and I know I get surveys from Buffer quite often, um, that they probably in those early days already went back to the customers very early. What else would you like to see yeah, kind sure. of questions? Mm. I had a really funny um, story that was told to me by an entrepreneur friend of mine. He said, oh, yeah, I was with this group of entrepreneurs and we're all talking about fundraising and pitch strategies and everything. And then uh, and one guy was kind of quiet and then and they turned to him and they said, well, how, what's your fundraising strategy? How are you getting investment? He said, oh, yeah, I'm doing something really unusual. I'm, I'm doing customer uh, funded <laughs> development. <laughs> and they all sort of shut up. <laughs> I that was great. Well, um, what are what are some of the signals you're seeing right now in you know that that could be signals of major inflection points, particularly in in the environment we find ourselves in with COVID, and you know people are talking about what the post COVID world will look like. Yeah. Um, well, I think there's a few things that are that are. I mean, it, COVID has been a big accelerator, right? Um, so we're certainly seeing the digital agenda advance much more rapidly than mm. it had before. So I, you know, companies talked a good game about digital for a long time, but it wasn't a necessity. It wasn't here today. It wasn't like we have to do something about digital right now. Uh, that has changed. And so I think what you've seen is a real acceleration of digital transformation, digital whatever. So I think I think you'll you'll definitely see that accelerate as mm. because it's because it's essential now you know if you if you didn't have digital connectivity right now you would be in the soup so a second thing that i see that i think you'll see is what i'll call a great flushing out and you know if you think about it globally i won't say we had a, a hugely successful economy and let me come back to that in a minute but but we did have an economy that was expanding and and it was fairly stable you know it wasn't it wasn't experiencing like biannual shocks or anything. So you had 10 years of stuff. Now think about, you know, if you don't periodically clean out your closets, what do they look like after 10 years? Hmm. So my suspicion is there's organizations all over the planet that have sort of accumulated weird little businesses that never really went away or odd things somebody tried and evangelized for and then the champion left, but nobody kind of knew what to do with the assets left behind. So I think you're going to see a, a great flushing out of, of all kinds of different assets. Um, and, and that will, first of all, it could provide some fuel for future entrepreneurship, right? So, you know, there'll be great people who are now been cut loose. There's going to be, you know, office desks and, and cool air on chairs and things going for a song, you know, because we don't need them. So a lot of assets people used to think were essential or are now going to be, either they weren't paying attention to them or they thought they were important are now going to be changing in value. And that always creates entrepreneurial uh, uh, opportunity. Then I think we've got a whole um, rethinking to do about, about, you know, the whole relationship between, I think we're finally in a stage where work is a thing you do, not a place you go to. Mm. Um, and you know, one of the one of the more enduring comments I hear from you know the more privileged end of the of the working spectrum is I've had so many business travelers say to me, you know, this idea of getting on a plane to go to Singapore for a half day meeting, like yeah. what was I thinking? Yeah. Um, 
And so I think a lot of those kind of habits, we we sort of sleepwalked our way into, oh, of course, I'll take that meeting in Milwaukee. And yeah, yeah, of course, I got to go to the you know annual electricians convention and, and all that stuff. And I think it's going to be quite a long time before we return to those because we've been inventing, you know, humans are ingenious creatures. Mm. We've been inventing all these other ways of doing some of those things. So I was having a hilarious conversation, well, retrospectively hilarious with um, some clients and big global company, and they're taking their big global corporate event and turning it virtual. And they want to be super respectful of the fact that they've got people in all these different time zones all over the place. But we're also doing a workshop component, and they wanted me to do some facilitation on the workshops. And, you know, under one plan, it would have had me like facilitating at two in the morning because they wanted to be respectful to the people in Singapore and everything else. And I finally said to them, you know, um, like, don't take this the wrong way, but your people who are based in Asia, places like Singapore and Vietnam and, you know, wherever, they're used to getting on airplanes. They've been on seven hour flights every two weeks, like for their entire lives. I honestly don't think for one day it's going to bother them to get up at four in the morning and attend a virtual um, <laughs> discussion. And the room went kind of quiet and they were like, oh, that's a great point. Because if they had to come here physically to the meeting, which was the original mm. design, you know, it's what, a 13 hour flight from Singapore. And then you've got to get settled and need yeah. time to kind of get your head over it. I miss anyway, a lot so, more sleep. Yeah. <laughs> Well, but I think I think a lot of those things are really going to be rethought, and mm. particularly in sectors like business travel. Um, I I just think first of all we're going to have to justify it, right? So mm. business travel that used to be suck it up and get on the plane, and I think we're now going to see the opposite arrangement. Why 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 do you need to be on the plane? Tell tell me what mm. tell me what just. I think the bar is going to be a lot higher to justify business trips and business travel. Um. A couple of other somewhat darker things that I think are going on. Um, I think we're at risk of losing a whole generation of women, um, y you know, because if they're at home with little kids and you've got two people who are working and you're trying to, um, you know, balance out the chores, there's only so long you can make that work. And one of the things I'm concerned about is that if this just goes on and on and on, which it looks as though it's going to, um, that we could just see a whole bunch of women basically get pushed out of the workplace because they're still, you know, in many cases, primary caregivers, whether it's for their parents or whether it's for their children or whether it's for, you know, others. So that's a concern. Parallel to that, we've got a demographic issue, which has gotten some attention, but not much, which is we're not having babies right now. Um, mm. And that's not a fixable thing. Like when you have a gap in your in your population, <laughs> you, you can't come back and refill it later on. And you know, we don't you can't import aliens yet, right? <laughs> so um, so there's gonna be these weird, like, you know, bumps, I would suspect, in in demand for all, all kinds of things. Um, so I think that's that's another one that's sort of interesting. Hmm. That was a quite fascinating. I think there's lots of implications around that. I mean, one, you know, coming back first of all to the I mean, there's a lot to unpack there, but coming back, first of all, to the um, rapidly growing online, I think those people that have now been forced or forced to go online or forced to go online sooner than they've wanted to, I've heard a lot of people come back and say, wow, this is actually pretty good. You can do a lot more. You can reach a lot more people. You can take your, your um, local conference and all of a sudden it becomes an international conference because it's online. So there's all these opportunities opened up which i think is a great thing the other side of that though is you know what are the air how are the airlines going to react to that because it's a big drop in revenue how the how the office um you know people that own office buildings how they're going to react to so many more people working from home how are hotels going to react you know there's there's an implication i mean it's a ripple effect isn't it well and it flows over into things like construction so people are now asking for different things of their homes. People are saying, I, I need a quiet home office. I need a place I can break away and work while the kids play somewhere else. I mean, that's already starting to get into architectural designs. Hmm. But I will I will make an observation. Um, you know, we as human beings made a series of decisions which have resulted in our assuming that um, it is perfectly feasible and normal and okay for any human being on the planet who can come up with the money to get on an airplane and go any place else on the planet that they care to anytime they want to, right? So we've got this multi-billion dollar, massive, massive, massive airline industry. Um, and I don't think we've ever asked the question, is, is, is that a price the planet 
should mm. be able to bear. I mean, we've literally got billions of flights being taken. And each one of those is a little mini environmental disaster. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying travel's bad or we should, you know, be draconian in our legislature, but but when you can't properly price the impact of those kinds of decisions into the long run impact for, you know, the planet and for the rest of us, then I think it gets to be problematic. The sort of in parallel with that is, you know, we saw phenomena like Venice was actually considering imposing an entrance fee because they were just overrun. I mean, the city was literally being destroyed by the amount of tourism that it was trying to support. And things like those great big cruise ships, you know, it's like, like there are certain sectors where you're just asking the question, well, okay, it's pleasant for certain mm. segments and it's a nice thing to do and it, you know, whatever. But I, 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 I think we're not very conscious about the sort of, oh my God, it's going to be terrible for the airlines. Well, yeah, but it's better for the environment. Mm. Maybe it's not so bad for, you know, petrochemicals. Maybe it's better for places that were overrun with tourists. You know, maybe it's better for local communities where people will now stay more in their local communities. So, you know, I think it's, it's yes, it's painful if you're in that sector, right? And I totally am sympathetic to that. But on the other hand, should that sector be allowed to occupy the amount of resources yeah, that it yeah. does on the planet? And I think we don't have those conversations very much. Hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think there's an opportunity to step back and assess all that now, mm -hmm. um, given that, hey, you know, we've like, I heard somebody say that, you know, this pandemic is kind of the, the planet saying, let's hit the pause button for a little while. And, and in some ways, it's like that, isn't it? So we can take that step back. There, now, was, a, um, there was a very interesting plaque that was put up in Iceland. Uh, to commemorate the disappearance of a glacier that had stood there for tens of thousands of years. And the plaque said, um, this glacier has now disappeared. We, if current, if no action is taken, other glaciers are going to take its point. But this plaque is here to remind us we knew. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. All right. Now, I, um, I'm aware of the time and I do want to move on to the buzz round, but I just want to touch on one more point that you said there, because I think this this is a really important one. And, and it was about the, um, you know, the, the risk of disempowering future generations of women, which, you know, I, I think that would be incredibly sad. But um, I, I'm wondering isn't with the change in the way we're working and more working from home, doesn't that create more opportunities to, and, and what do we need to do, I guess, to yeah. make sure that it does create those opportunities? Cause it's, it's not a case of saying, okay, women have to go into full-time work and they've got to manage the primary care responsibilities that they might adopt um, as well, rather than saying, well, working from home gives us an opportunity to change the model and maybe it's a case of you know let's build some models of more job share so that it's a you know there's there's part-time roles more available which gives women different opportunities or you know what do we need to do to make sure that doesn't happen sure so i think the first big thing we need to get our heads around is Right now, corporate careers, and I'm talking about corporate careers, not mm. you know um, other other kinds. And other kinds need other kinds of remedies. But, but let's just stick with corporate careers for a minute. Um, the kind that MBA might take, right? Is right now they're designed as a ratchet. So you ratchet to one level. If you fall off the track, you fall off the track. You ratchet to the next level. If you fall off, you fall off. You ratchet to the next level. If you fall off. And while that is starting to change, I think we really need to think a lot harder about job design and, in fact, career design. So one mm. of the big trends I'm watching is, you know, what I'm seeing in my cohort, you know, there are women in their 50s, 60s, even 70s breaking out. It's my turn now, starting businesses. They have resolved the meaning of life for themselves. You know, <laughs> they're done with all that, you know, well, and, and, uh, and, you know, they're, they're, they're full of energy. They're living longer, they're living healthier lives. So if we thought about careers, not as something that puts the greatest pressure on people at the greatest moment of need for their personal lives, you know, I mean, you know, biology does not, mm. you can't fool it, right? Um, and so if we could figure out a way to sort of say, hey, your career doesn't have to sort of peak in your 30s, and then that, that sets, you know, the path for the rest of your life. Um, so I think what we will start to see, when I'm optimistic, when I'm optimistic, I think we will start to see a lot more people kind of coming and going as their personal needs 
um, shape what they have to be doing at any particular time. And I think organizations, if they're going to get the best talent, they're going to have to get used to, you know, somebody who maybe has been out of the workforce for five years or somebody who has been doing something completely different before and now they want to make a career switch. Um, you know, I think we'll start to see a lot more of that kind of fluidity. Right now, a lot of corporate career structures are still very rigidly time bound, right? So, and it's all around a male life cycle. So your 20s, you come in, you figure out good, bad, whatever. Mm. Your 30s, your high potential are also runs. Your 40s, you're taking the reins of power. As I like to say, in your 50s, you're allowed one blonde and a Ferrari. And then in your 60s, you're sort of handing <laughs> on and being generous with the rest of the world. Um, well, women, that doesn't make any sense for women's lives. Not at all. Hmm. Um, and I think we, you know, we try to arc around it. We try to talk about, oh, well, it's going to be dual parenting and this and that. And, you know, whether it's kids or whether it's something else, um, whether it's I have to travel for business or whether it's I need to do a foreign mm -hmm. assignment or whether it's whatever in a in a partnership, if you have two people, one of them at any given point in time is going to be making a trade off. Uh, and I wouldn't call it so much making a sacrifice because in an ideal situation, and again, when, when I'm optimistic, in an ideal situation, both careers are a partnership um, opportunity. And so if you make these trade-offs throughout the life of your working life, I think then you can really achieve um, a way that a lot more people could have these fulfilling careers. And, and, and it won't be this sort of casting off of people into the sidelines. But my big worry is, you know, we know that for younger women, especially, so talk about women in their 20s, 30s, um, we know that network sponsors um, and, and, and mentors are hugely important. Well, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Uh, if you're not where those relationships can mm. be forged, how do you find them? So one of the things I do at Columbia is I actually run a program called Women in Leadership, and we tackle these kinds of issues. We say, okay, if you're, you know, if you're going to have to shift the normal way you do work, let's, let's do that intentionally. Let's talk about how you're going to build that infrastructure, even though it won't be uh, as easy as if you were just sashing through the office talking to Joe, you know, <laughs> right? So how yeah. can we do things that were different? Hmm. Yeah, well, there's a whole nother discussion there. I mean, it, this is absolutely fascinating, Rita. I, um, the other thing that, uh, and I'll close it off here, the other thing that it brought to mind, you know, your suggestion of we need to be more flexible about that. I mean, the, when you get to your, what was it, the 50s, you're allowed a blonde and a Ferrari. Uh, right. <laughs> Usually it's the mid fifties where in the corporate world, they say, okay, you're done, you're out of here. And it's like, there's this whole population of people that have had enormous experience that have done a whole range of things and got knowledge and wisdom that they could be sharing with others. And all of a sudden they're sidelined in their mid fifties. And like you say, you know, they could be living to the, uh, to their eighties or nineties and could be around and probably still have the energy and the will to make a contribution. I mean, whether that's, and to me, that's um, a trend that's gender independent. Right? That seems to be there. And, and coming back to your earlier point about we're not having babies as much. So there's this gap of the younger generation coming along. So, Hey, there's this resource here and speaking as an <laughs> older person, and there's this resource here that maybe we need to find a, a way to tap into again and and change the whole way we we work and the career structures like you've outlined there and and also you know bring or make the opportunities for women to actually participate on an equal footing in in the business world make that come to well, you know one one of the cool things about this this way of working is, you know, there's always five loud guys in the room who dominate, take up all the oxygen. Yeah. I can shut them off. <laughs> mute. The mute button. <laughs> mute. <laughs> My meeting, mute. <laughs> Love it. All right. Well, I think that's a good point to move on to the buzz, which is our innovation round. And it's designed to help our audience who are primarily innovators and leaders in their field with some tips from your experience. So I've got okay. five questions and hopefully you'll give us some answers that will inspire the listener to go and do something awesome today as a result. Cool. So what do you think the number one thing is we need to do to be more innovative? As leaders? Mm. Manage your agenda. Manage your agenda. So um, I will, and I mean that completely literally. Um, I go to a company and I'll say, oh, so you want innovation. Send me the meeting agendas where your last, you know, 
where your senior people got together to talk about important things. And I'll go down that list. And if I find innovation is topic, it's either not there at all, or it's topic like 14 right next to material safety data sheet updates. Believe me, <laughs> they're not taking it seriously. And if they're not taking it seriously, nobody else in the organization is going to. And that applies wherever in the company you are. So mm -hmm. if innovation is important to you, you'll talk about it. You'll spend time on it. When people meet you, they'll try to like duck out of your way in the hallway because they know you're going to ask the innovation <laughs> question they're not prepared to answer. Uh, you know, I mean, you can tell when a company cares and you can equally tell when they don't. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I love it. And I love uh, having been through meetings where the MSDS, the material safety data sheet discussion was put to the end when everybody was half asleep, I can uh, understand that if innovation <laughs> is near there, it's certainly not important. Exactly. Mm. Now, what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? New ideas? Um, I think very often new ideas are really concatenations of existing ideas that get mashed up together in a new mm. way. So I do a lot, and I'm fortunate because my job permits me to do this. I do an awful lot of sort of synthesizing um, bits of information from all kinds of places. So in any given day, I could be on Twitter, I could be doing a podcast, I could be doing a webinar, I could be teaching, <laughs> I could be reading, um, I could be doing interviews. So there's a lot of kind of patterns that you start to see when you get that much variety in your inputs. And so what I would encourage people to do is just because it's not a brand new idea and they weren't the first to ever think about it, but open your mind to sort of you know, if I put together, um, I don't know, if I put together a, a cat hairbrush and a 3D printer and mm -hmm. um, a microwave oven, you know, something really interesting might come out of that, you know, and maybe there's nothing that comes out of that. Um, I think the other thing that's that's super important is working from the customer back, um, you know, finding those problems and pain points, which often people aren't conscious about because they're working around them. And we do this a hundred times a day. We work around stuff that doesn't work right. And, you know, I recall your experience, your frustrating customer experience. Those are workarounds. They're done because somebody didn't really understand what the customer's job was that they wanted to get done. Hmm. Yeah, that's right. That's great advice. And I love the connecting the dots and um, putting what might seem at the face of it completely disparate things together and saying, what, what would happen if we connected these up? Mm-hmm. Do you have a favorite resource you use a lot? Um, I actually use social media a lot, um, mainly because it does, like, I don't follow everybody that is in my circles. So I follow a lot of people with from very disparate points of view. Um, and I find that stimulates thought, you know, even if you don't agree with them, even if you're mm. like, that's a crazy thing. But it's a crazy thing somebody's prepared to be at least proud enough of that they're putting their name to it, you know, in a public place. So let's think about that. And especially if they're challenging my existing beliefs, I think that's really valuable. Mm. Yeah, we, we often, and I mean, there's a lot of political discussion goes on in, uh, in the social media. And I guess um, I, I, I'll sort of hint at my political beliefs, but my wife came to me the other day and said, oh, occasionally I go on to the, um, well, I'll name it the Fox and Friends channel just to uh, see what they say. And I say, well, have you been brainwashed yet? And she said, no, no, it's, it's occasionally good to see a totally different point of view. And uh, she says, I can, I can only take it in small doses, but it's interesting to see a different point of view so it's yeah i think it's really important and and you know and i have had a couple of occasions where i've said huh you know they've got a real point there like mm. I, I belong to a writers group um and many, many people whose names you would know they're very well-known people but we were having this fascinating discussion about why is it so hard to talk about politics um in a way that isn't you know, super combative mm. in a way that genuinely has a spirit of inquiry behind it, because there's always the seed of something that's true. I mean, even if it's a crazy conspiracy theory, there's always, you know, the reason that it, they, 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 they're so durable is that there's always the seed of something that's true in them. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, it had to come from somewhere, didn't it? And mm -hmm. hmm. All right. That's great. Um, what's the best way to keep a client on track? Ah, with innovation. Hmm. With innovation, or if you if you 
doing leadership work with them? Leadership work. Yeah. Um, well, with innovation, I have a technique I call discovery driven planning, which is essentially you, you have a sense of what the goal is, but instead of doing what you might do in a traditional business where you know a lot, right, you re recognize you really don't know anything. So it's kind of like the buffer story, right? So the first mm. thing I'm going to test for is, does anybody click on this? The second thing I'm going to test for, is anybody going to pay for this? The third thing I'm going to test for is, can I actually sign up a customer? The fourth thing, I'm, you know, and, and on and on. Um, and so I think with, with innovation, uh, keeping clients on track really is, you know, let's talk about your next checkpoint. Let's talk about how long it's going to take you to get there. What did you learn? Did you make progress through them? And if they stop making progress through checkpoints, that's a, that's a red flag, hmm. right? It means they're stuck or something, or they can't figure something out or something's wrong. With leadership, I think the the main things I look at there are, you know, do we have do we have a strategy? Um, and that sounds deceptively simple. It's hard to come up with a good, clear, simple strategy that everybody understands. And then what I like to do is turn the strategy into what I call a series of screening statements. Um, and screening statements would be, I'll use an example. Um, if you think of um, Dyson, you know, the, the vacuum cleaner people. Mm. Um, I mean, basically Dyson, if it sucks or blows or uses batteries, you know, we'll, we'll mm. consider it. Um, but their business model is very much they have to get super high margins because they could spend 10 years worth of R&D on something. They're a very persistent company, uh, but they only want to be in markets where they have really high margins. So as an example of a screen for Dyson might be, does this opportunity represent a high margin opportunity? Because if it's a commodity, it's not. Mm. So that's an example of taking this sort of grand strategy and boiling it down to things people can really understand. And when you've got that level of clarity, then you can build alignment. Everybody knows what they're supposed to do and, and, and they go forward. So I think mm. that's very valuable. Yeah, I love those kind of frameworks where it's sort of everybody, everybody's empowered to make decisions because they've got a really clear sort of set of screens, to use your terminology, to yeah. filter it through. And it's a pretty clear yes, no, whether you go forward with that. Mm. Mm -hmm. All right. And what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? Uh, find an unmet customer need <laughs> um, that you are uniquely qualified to fulfill. And that's not, you know, I mean, that's super easy to say, but mm. I, you know, people, people spend an awful lot of time thinking about themselves <laughs> and not thinking enough about, you know, what is it that you bring that somebody and the actually... paradox is that nobody else actually <laughs> thinks that much about you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Not even a, a um, fraction of it, <laughs> and I'm and I'm being a little bit uh, cynical now, and I don't mean to be, but I think that that you know when you can say yes, this is something a customer really, you know, has an urgent and hungry need for, and I can actually do something about that. That that's a wonderful opportunity to differentiate. Hmm. Yeah, I love that, and it's it kind of addresses the two things that have to match up, um, and and when you say. You know, you're uniquely placed to serve or fill that need. It, that doesn't mean to say that you know nobody else can fill that need. That means to say that you're a perfect match for a particular audience that you've defined, right? I think what people forget, and it comes back to the way I define power. So I mentioned this women in leadership program that I that I run, and women have whether it's socialization or whether it's something else, I don't know, but women have had historically a very uneasy relationship with power. And we, most societies have a very uneasy relationship with powerful women, you know, people who mm. behave with power, act with power, whatever. And I try to get them to think about it in a different way. I said, you know, having to have power means that you have control over a scarce and valuable resource. And we all have control over a scarce and valuable resource. And that's our unique experiences, learnings, positions. You know, we all entered the world at a unique moment in time. We all have had unique experiences growing up. Uh, we've all been exposed to unique inputs. And I think we don't think enough about that. And we've mm. all got something to offer. You know, if it's information, if it's a shoulder to cry on, if it's, a, you know, somebody to rant to, if you really want to rant in a safe place. I mean, there's always something we can offer. And I think we don't often give ourselves enough credit for the, the uniqueness that we have. Mm. Yeah, that's that's really good advice. All right. Well, thanks, Rita. This has been absolutely fabulous. Now, where can people Great. find out more about you and find out about your books and maybe even get in touch yeah. and say thanks for all that you've shared with us today? 
That would be awesome. So I have a website, incredibly creatively named RitaMcGrath.com, um, <laughs> and that's where I store um, newsletters. They're free. I, I publish them monthly-ish. I usually get out about 11 a year. Um, they So that's RitaMcGrath.com. Um, I'm launching some new tools-based kind of ideas on a sister company called Valise.com. That's V-A-L-I-Z-E. And we're starting off with some basic diagnostics and surveys people can play around with. So that's still at the very, that's at like buffer 1.0 <laughs> stage right now. Um, but I'm always eager to hear what people would like to see in that. And then I'm easily found at Columbia. You can just search on me there. You'll find my email address and that's an easy way to get in touch. All right. And we'll post links to all that in the show notes, including your books as well. And um, yeah, we'll have to check out Belize. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, now what parting advice would you like to leave our listener today? Um, you know, where there's uncertainty, there's always opportunity. Mm. And I think those that are entrepreneurially inclined, and I would imagine if you're listening to this podcast, that includes you, um, you know, that it's a question of looking for them and then getting yourself ready to really be able and willing uh, to move forward with those. So I'd think about it that way. Mm. Yeah, that's great advice. And I love you know, the idea of reframing this in, yes, there's uncertainty, yes, there's things that are not going well at the moment, but there's also a whole lot of opportunity. And, you know, even if it's just the opportunity for how can we how can we get ourselves in a place where we come out of this stronger and how can we help other people come out of this stronger? Yeah. Hmm. Love it. Finally, Rita, who's someone else I need to get on this podcast and why? Oh, um. I think an interesting um, person would be uh, David Kidder of Bionic. I don't know if you're familiar with him. No. He's a serial serial entrepreneur, um, author of a couple of books, um, runs this, this um, entrepreneurial consultancy called Bionic um, that basically installs an innovation operating system in companies. So what he does is he takes a bunch of entrepreneurs and gets them into a large organization and says, okay, you know, we're going to kind of increase your clock speed and, and get you get you going in a much more rich way. So he would be a good candidate. Mm. All right. Well, you are his co-founder, who's a woman named Ann Berkovich. Um, but if you contact Bionic, they will let you know. Okay, great. Well, we might get an introduction from you to David and Ann and uh, see if we can get either or on the show. There you go. Well, thanks so much for sharing your time and your insights with us so generously today. Rita, this has been fabulous. I've enjoyed this conversation so much. We've gone into all kinds of different areas. We started off with innovation and inflection points, but um, then started exploring specifically what's going on right now. So it was a fascinating conversation and there's lots more to unpack, but maybe we'll have to have another episode sometime soon. Okay, that sounds good. Thanks a lot. All right, nice talking to you. Right, bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed that insightful and engaging conversation with Rita and took something away from her episode. My big takeaways were how to read leading indicators in a way that they're not just qualitative and opinions and the idea of finding an unmet customer need that you are uniquely placed to serve. I'd love to know what you took away from Rita's episode. Leave a comment below the blog post, which you can find at innovabiz.co forward slash Rita McGrath. That is R-I-T-A-M-C-G-R-A-T-H. Or lowercase, all one word, innovabiz.co forward slash Rita McGrath. You'll also find contact information there for getting in touch with Rita, as well as links to her website, her books, her social media pages, and the other resources we spoke about in our conversation today. Rita suggested that we have a conversation with David Kidder of Bionic on a future Innova Buzz podcast episode. So David, keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast, courtesy of Rita McGrath. Tune in again to the next episodes of the Innova Buzz podcast where we've got even more fantastic guests lined up, including tech investor and business mentor Johan Naguera and Chris Barras Brown of Upping Your Elvis. Thanks for listening to this episode. 
Make sure you subscribe to the show to be reminded of new episodes. It's free to subscribe. Leave a review if you like. Even if you don't like me, I'm okay with that. I'm asking you to leave a review because it helps other people find this show. Go to innovabiz.co to join our marketing transformation community and access a free gift my team and I made for you. It's the Marketing Master Mini Class. We want to give you everything you need to transform your marketing into a human-centered, relationship-focused growth engine. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, be awesome and keep innovating.